Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.31, The Disaster at Fort William Henry. Last time, we spent our episode looking at the events of 1756. 1756 had been a year of transition for both the French and the British. Following the 1755 capture of Dieskau, the French war effort had been turned over to Louis-Joseph de Montcalm. The British colonies were also under new leadership. William Johnson and company have the Earl of Loudoun now taking the reins. For both Montcalm and Loudoun, they were just entering into the game when the French moved on the British fort at Oswego, though that did not stop Montcalm from taking credit for the victory. Loudon, on the other hand, was quick to remind everybody that he had just arrived shortly before Oswego. The stakes internationally had suddenly become much larger as well. No longer was the French and Indian War something contained to North America, as the war spilled out into Europe in the form of the Seven Years' War. As 1757 was ushered in, the new leaders in North America were eager to make their mark and establish themselves with a major victory something to move their side ahead and give them that clear advantage in the conflict. Today, we are going to spend our time looking at just that. The battle that is going to come to define the French and Indian War in 1757 would take place along the banks of Lake George. This battle is going to have long-lasting and dramatic ramifications for both the British and the French, and would change both the substance and the form of the war in North America. Loudon understandably wanted to start strong in 1757. However, just as those before him had learned, he quickly found that ignoring colonial politics was a whole lot easier said than done. Much as with Braddock, Loudon really had just expected that the colonists were going to fall into line and get with the program. However, we are now some 96 episodes into this podcast, and I think we can all agree that the one thing that the colonists never do is just fall easily into line. This, of course, came much to the considerable annoyance of Loudon. Now, before we can really get going on the campaign of 1757, we must first take just a moment to introduce a new player to our story. This man would come not only to define the rest of the French and Indian War, but whose policies would directly affect the next two decades of Britain's relationship with her North American colonies. The man I am speaking about is William Pitt. Born in 1708, William Pitt rose through the ranks and became a leading member of the Whig Party. In 1756, Pitt would become the leader of Parliament as he ascended to the position of the leader of the House of Commons. Now, next time, we are going to spend much, much more time with William Pitt and his specific policies. However, what I want you to know for this week is that it is William Pitt who is going to be largely in control of the war effort back in Britain. Returning to the colonies, Loudon had initially set his eyes on the big prize, Quebec. However, William Pitt, taking an active role in planning the war, vetoed this and instead instructed Loudon to focus his attention on Louisbourg. In the not-too-distant past, we spent a great deal of time hanging out with our British friends as they captured Lewisburg. This was what we spent virtually all of episode 3.23 discussing. If you will recall, Lewisburg stands right near the mouth of the St. Lawrence. Here is, however, where Loudon and Pitt differed. Loudon wanted to move north through Canada on an approach towards Quebec. His logic was that by moving north, it would essentially tie up more of the French and Indians in the region, giving an extra degree of protection to the frontiers. Pitt's suggestion of coming up the St. Lawrence was a better overall plan. However, it would leave the frontiers dangerously exposed. Despite any argument that Loudon's plan would have better protected the frontiers, it was William Pitt back in Britain who was now calling the shots, and it was Loudon who was going to have his hands tied and would need to adjust. Loudon's plan, therefore, was to stage large numbers of provincial troops at Fort William Henry and at Fort Edward. These provincials would act as a check on French aggression towards Albany and the rest of the New York frontier. Meanwhile, Loudon and the British regulars would take care of the attack on Lewisburg. With his marching orders received, Loudon turned towards the logistics of the expedition, 
it is right about here that things are going to become frustrating. And for the colonists, Loudon is going to become a much more formidable foe than the French ever were. Say what you will about William Shirley. The guy understood what the colonists and their colonial governments would do. He knew how to play the game. If Loudon recognized that there was a game to be played, he certainly showed little evidence that he much cared, nor that he intended to play along. He was the one in control, and, much to the chagrin of the colonists, he was going to exercise that power. At his most core level, and influencing all of his decisions, Loudon really did not trust the colonists. This isn't the first time that we have seen a British commander share such feelings. Indeed, many of the British commanders found that the colonists were slow to offer help and were more concerned with self-promotion than serving the empire. Regardless, however, Loudon recognized the necessity of using provincial troops and knew that the war effort did ultimately depend upon their cooperation. During the latter months of 1756, Loudon set out to work with John Bradstreet. Although Bradstreet was a loyal Shirley ally, Loudon quickly understood that he had connections and knew the logistical challenges that lie ahead. Loudon agreed with the assessment by Bradstreet and therefore would spend much of his time working on improving the American supply lines. Ultimately for Loudon, many of these logistical changes are going to end up being his most considerable contribution to the war effort. However, it is along these lines that Loudon would meet some of his fiercest opponents from the colonial assemblies. With the colonial assemblies and Loudon arguing about supply lines and logistics for how to improve them, other rifts would open up over the question of how to best utilize provincial officers and troops. Specifically, the question came back to that issue we had talked about last time. The provincial officers were very disgruntled at the idea that any British regular officer would outrank them, no matter what that ranking actually was. Furthermore, provincial troops were not thrilled at the prospect of being subjected to full military discipline. Unlike Shirley, Loudon really could not have cared less if provincial officers had their feelings hurt by being outranked by regulars. If you'll recall, Shirley had devised a plan of separating the provincials from the regulars to solve this problem. Loudon, however, viewed that solution as being foolish. His solution was simply to have fewer colonial officers per group. Loudon requested that the colonies provide 100 man companies with only a single field officer. As there was only a single officer, there were fewer people to get bent out of shape or insulted by the decree. Loudon felt that keeping the men separated was equally pointless. Though he did not generally hold the provincials in high regard, he viewed their place in the war as doing some of the major supporting tasks, thus freeing up the far more trained regulars to do the actual fighting. This meant, however, that the provincials would be subject to the same discipline that the British regulars were. For the invasion of Louisbourg, Loudon had already decided that it would be primarily British regulars leading the charge. This means that, critically, the defense of the colonies themselves was going to fall on the shoulders of the provincial soldiers. This is something that is going to have ramifications later on today, but for the moment it goes to show how Loudon viewed the colonists. They were very much the bench players to his starting lineup of regular troops. Nothing about this should come as much of a surprise. However, it helps inform us of Loudon's views of the conflict and just what his available resources were. Before Loudon left to make his attempt on Louisbourg, he did two things that would really catch the ire of the colonists more than anything else. Amongst the most difficult logistical problems for Loudon is that his men needed a place to sleep. The massive influx of regulars into the colonies had stretched thin the ability to adequately house all of the troops, which forced him to look towards quartering the troops amongst the civilian population. To say that this was a deeply unpopular move, would be an understatement. It was so hated that there is now a constitutional amendment specifically regarding quartering, though in all fairness that is more in response to the Quartering Acts of 1765 and 1774, which we will talk about next season. The colonists and their colonial assemblies hated the idea of quartering and viewed it as violating their rights. Most often, the colonists just outright refused Loudon 
who then clarified that he was not asking, but rather was informing. The colonies relied primarily upon the English Mutiny Act of 1689, which is where the initial distinction between private and public housing will come up. In the Mutiny Act, it outright stated that forced quartering was unconstitutional. The law said that when quartering was necessary, that such act should be done at inns, taverns, and anywhere else that sells alcohol. These would become what is known as public houses. Public houses could not refuse an order of quartering. However, the law excluded private houses, the places where people actually went home to and lived, from being used as a place where troops could be quartered. The first fight over quartering came in Albany, shortly after Loudon arrived. The plan there was that around 50 soldiers would be put up in public housing, with another 1,500 to 2,000 going directly into personal private homes. This drew the ire of the colonial leaders, who suddenly were very interested in that 1689 Mutiny Act. However, Loudon had a serious problem here. There were too many soldiers and not enough public places to keep them all. This is where Loudon comes along with threats and basically forced the colonists into compliance. While Albany was the first place to complain, the argument would spread throughout the colonies, with the majority leaning heavily on the public versus private distinction under English law. Depending where it was, the colonies dictated just how stringently colonists resisted. In Pennsylvania, for example, colonists shoved as many troops as possible into local taverns. Men were sleeping often on piles of straw or on the floor, as there simply were not enough beds for them all. Eventually, Philadelphia would allow their newly built hospital to be used to hold them in. Though Philadelphia actually got off a whole lot easier than a lot of other places, considering that they at least had ample public space. Other places in the colonies were not so lucky, and you do indeed see troops getting quartered with families. This was common in places such as Albany where there were too many troops compared to the number of available public houses. What would pragmatically come out of this in many places was a move towards building barracks to keep soldiers out of private homes. Of course, building said barracks was going to come with its own expenses, which also annoyed the colonists, who felt that their taxes were already too high, such as in Massachusetts. However, as far as major cities in colonial North America went in 1757, building barracks throughout the colonies for the quartering of troops would remain a reality for the next several years, much to the annoyance of everybody involved. While it was not totally lost on Loudon what the complaints of the colonists were, he likewise was himself in a situation where there was a war to win, and sacrifices had to be made. It was on this logic that Loudon justified his actions, writing in 1757 that he viewed what he was doing as being the right thing to do. Now, quartering is going to be something that we are going to be coming back to next season. And while it would do nothing to endear Loudon to the colonists, it was his decision to shut down colonial ports that is really going to infuriate everybody. Loudon was planning a major offensive on Louisbourg and, understandably, was not eager to share the details with the French. The problem is that colonial traders were still regularly doing business with the French, to the great annoyance of Loudon. Black market business efforts aside, the real concern was that these sailors who became privy of the attack would share their insights with the French that they are doing business with. Loudon, embracing the whole loose lips sink ships mentality of the future, decided that he needed to get control over the black market trade, and especially the sharing of information. To accomplish this, in March 1757, Loudon shut down colonial ports to all activities other than that necessary for the military operations. This alone was not a terribly shocking event. Today we hear about the closure of ports during the 18th century and our mind turns towards the closure of Boston's port as a reaction to the Boston Tea Party. However, we are still some 16 years away from the Tea Party, and the events of 1757 were viewed far differently. The shutdown by Loudoun isn't even the first time during the war that such actions had been taken. There had been widespread port closures in each of the past two years. Colonial assemblies and merchants alike understood the reasoning and generally did not grouse too much about it. It 
is important to note that during the closures, all three of them, it isn't simply a single region being shut down, but all of the colonies. So this is not just some regional event, it is the whole of the North American colonies. So what was it then about Loudoun's shutdown that so infuriated the colonists? Whereas the previous shutdowns had been short, Loudoun's was indefinite. There was no set date for it to end. It was rather just going to go, seemingly in perpetuity. The colonial economies were already stretched thin, as the war had come at a tremendous cost to the colonists. In major cities, as a result of the quartering crisis, more money was being demanded in order to pay for the construction of barracks. Now, however, because of Loudon's embargo, he just completely obliterated the economy. Tobacco from the south was stuck in ports with nowhere to go. As storehouses quickly filled up, prices for the plant tanked. It wasn't just tobacco either. Essentially, all crops saw wild price fluctuations as the products could not leave the colonies. This embargo lasted for months and did not officially end until June 27th. Even on the 27th, it is not as though Loudon said, Thanks guys, you can get back to work now. But rather, the colonists essentially undermined him and just reopened anyway. The end of the embargo came when the Virginia House of Burgesses decided that enough was enough. The Burgesses voted to deny any further funding of the war unless the embargo was lifted. Much to the considerable anger of Loudon, Governor Dinwiddie sided with the Burgesses. Shortly thereafter, with Virginia unilaterally reopening the tobacco trade, Maryland got in on the fun and also lifted the embargo. While Loudon seemed to care little about the well-being or happiness of the colonists, pragmatically, he required the funding and support that the colonists provided. Plus, by the time this comes to a head, Loudon was already making his way north towards Lewisburg, which substantially reduced the risk of some unscrupulous sailor ruining his surprise attack. Loudon, therefore, reluctantly lifted the embargo. It should be noted, however, that even when the embargo was lifted, it was not exactly handled smoothly. We know from Benjamin Franklin that once the embargo was lifted, Loudon failed to pass news along to South Carolina, where they remained operating as though the embargo was still in place for an additional three months. This, of course, did little to help the colonists come around to Loudon. Now, in Loudon's defense, closing the ports actually had proved very successful. The specifics of the British war effort did not leak to the French, as we had seen in the past. Despite all the anger and frustrations over the colonists' actions, Loudon would finally get on his way to Lewisburg on June 20th. What Loudon was completely unaware of, however, is that the major events of the war were going on back along the shores of Lake George, where he had left some 5,500 provincials split between Fort William Henry and Fort Edward. In addition, Loudon had provided for two regiments of regulars to defend the upstate New York frontier, adding about another 1,300 men to the count. In charge of the defense up along Lake George was Daniel Webb. Loudon did not exactly hold Webb in high regard, thinking that he was overly timid. Thus, Loudon had rather low expectations. At one point, he had suggested that Webb should move and attempt a siege on Fort Corralin. However, he knew that this probably was not something that was going to be in the cards. Loudon was being stingy with his regulars in consideration of the coming attack on Lewisburg. The effect of this likely ruled out any kind of British offensive mission against Fort Corralin, meaning that for the 1757 campaign season, the order of the day at Fort William Henry was going to be maintaining a defensive posture and protecting the lower Hudson Valley from French incursion. Loudon had significant concerns about the security along the lake early in the campaign season of 1757. That March, a small group of French and Indian forces had attacked Fort William Henry. The attack itself is not really noteworthy for pushing the war in any particular direction. It was a quick four-day siege that saw the attackers quickly move out. There was minimal damage in regards to loss of human life, and as far as actually capturing the fort, that never really seems to have been the primary aim for the French. The French had attacked with nothing in the way of artillery, 
which is a pretty good hint that actually capturing the fort was not something that they were really planning on. However, while the fort would survive the attack, much of the infrastructure and buildings surrounding the fort were destroyed. This includes an all-important sloop which helped the British maintain security on the lake itself. The bigger problem is that repairs were slow in coming, and that by the time Loudoun had set sail for Lewisburg, Fort William Henry still sat unrepaired from the March engagement. Compounding this problem was a serious loss of intelligence on what was going on at Fort Carrelin. Months before in January 1757, the British had launched a reconnaissance mission. The mission went poorly and several scouts were killed. Combined now with the attack in March, the destruction of the British sloop, and the general state of disrepair of Fort William Henry, those stationed there were facing a real crisis in the fort's ability to project power. Unfortunately for Webb and Loudon, the French were also keenly aware that Fort William Henry had become vulnerable. Even as Loudon began his expedition to Lewisburg, the French were amassing a large force at Fort Corralin. The previous year had been fantastic for the French recruiting efforts. Victories against the British and at Fort Oswego had made the French recruitment of Indians far easier, and suddenly Montcalm found himself with a large force just itching for a battle. As we discussed last time, Montcalm himself was never really a huge fan of using native fighters, often detesting what he perceived as being uncivilized and uncontrollable conduct during battle. However, practically speaking, Montcalm was always going to have to begrudgingly accept alliances with Native Americans if he hoped to prevail. By the end of July, Montcalm was sitting on a combined French and Indian force of approximately 8,000, all poised to move to the south against Fort William Henry. Recall from earlier that between the provincials and the regulars split between Fort William Henry and Fort Edward, there was a combined 6,500 men. At Fort William Henry itself, there were only some 2,500 men, which further was reduced to just around 1,100 or so when you factor in those who were actually in fighting shape. Under the command of Lieutenant Colonel George Monroe, the men at the fort seemed to have gotten word that the French were amassing a huge force sometime late in June. At the end of July, Monroe sent a reconnaissance mission to figure out just how serious the situation was. The good news for Monroe is that he did get his answer. The situation was dire. The bad news for Monroe is that he would find out how dire the situation was when Indian forces attacked the reconnaissance mission. The men on the expedition had traveled via boats, which were attacked. Several of the boats were lost and several men drowned during the mission. As the bedraggled survivors of the reconnaissance mission limped back into Fort William Henry, it was suddenly apparent that the British had a genuine problem on their hands. Unfortunately for the British, they were facing some very serious logistical issues at the end of July. Loudon was off, preoccupied with Lewisburg. Webb, the guy who is supposed to be commanding the defense of Lake George and Fort William Henry, just really is not up to the task. Webb was actually there in Fort William Henry when the survivors made their way back into the fort. He quickly barked out some orders to defend the fort, made an ambiguous promise that he would send help, and then quickly decided that he had urgent business back south at Fort Edward. Making matters much worse, Webb really was not all that interested in actually sending a meaningful number of reinforcements. Monroe needed real help, and what Webb provided him was a paltry 200 men, not nearly enough to stop the French from just coming in and steamrolling Fort William Henry. So why was Webb so reluctant to send more men? Though there is some debate here, Webb may have likely viewed Fort William Henry as already being a lost cause. The fort still bore damage that was unrepaired from the March attack. Plus, evidence that the French had a large force marching south meant that Fort William Henry was always going to end up seriously outnumbered. There is an argument to be made that it made sense to limit the amount of resources and men that it was going to cost defending Fort William Henry, when the outcome of the coming battle was all but predetermined. Montcalm also seemed to be feeling pretty confident about his prospects. 
Upon his approach, he sent an emissary forward under a flag of truce to inform Monroe that he and his men were likely doomed and that he would offer them the chance to surrender. On the surface, there really was nothing unique about this. Montcalm was a firm believer in the decorum of warfare, and offering a preemptive surrender was good siege etiquette. Montcalm also was not surprised when, despite being in a pretty dire position, Monroe made the standard bold claims of his intention to fight to the death rather than surrender. And with that, Montcalm and his army began the siege of Fort William Henry. The actual bombardment began on August 6, and within a few days the fort was teetering on the brink of disaster. Fort William Henry, as discussed earlier, was in a rough spot to begin with. That damage from the March raid was suddenly proving to be a very serious problem for the defenders of the fort. Monroe was facing a decidedly uphill battle, something that he was very aware of. He wrote desperately back to Webb, urgently requesting that he come and reinforce the fort from the south, letting Webb know that otherwise Fort William Henry was just as vulnerable as Oswego had been the year prior. Down at Fort Edward, Webb was already well aware of the situation going on up at Fort William Henry. Webb, recognizing the nature of the battle, wrote back to Monroe, informing him that he was facing a shortage of men, with only 1,600 holding down his fort. As a result, he was going to be unable to offer any kind of rescue mission that might save Fort William Henry. Rather, Webb, realizing that the fort was inevitably going to fall, recommended to Monroe that he begin treating with Montcalm in the hopes of securing acceptable terms of surrender. It is worth noting that this letter was sent on August 4th, so actually two days before the bombardment even began. Unfortunately for pretty much everybody involved, except the French, the messenger tasked with bringing the message to Monroe was killed en route. Rather than this important bit of information being delivered to Monroe, it was instead delivered directly to Montcalm. Montcalm, not wanting to interfere with the underlying message, went ahead and sent the letter himself onto Monroe. He did go ahead, however, and include a personal letter to Monroe that his boss was a pretty smart guy and that he probably should surrender. The letter from Webb reached Monroe on August 7th. Two days later, on August 9th, Monroe was looking at an increasingly bleak situation. His artillery was failing. The French were now digging trenches right outside of the Western Wall, which was at serious risk of being breached. Outside the fort lay the terrifying prospect of hundreds of Native American warriors pouring into the fort. The British were surrounded. They were outnumbered, outgunned, and no help was coming. The constant bombardment meant that the men had not slept in days, putting them under untenable amounts of stress and fatigue. On the afternoon of August 9th, Monroe realized that further resistance was futile, and he surrendered the fort. Montcalm offered a generous surrender. The captured British would be escorted to Fort Edward, where they would be released on the conditions that those at Fort William Henry do not rejoin the fight for 18 months. The soldiers could keep small arms and their personal belongings. The French would obviously get Fort William Henry, as well as an agreement that the British would release French prisoners, military, and civilian from their custody. It was an honorable surrender on acceptable terms, which Monroe eagerly agreed to. Montcalm had already made the decision that he would not push his luck by marching on Fort Edward. His men were tired and eager to get back home for the harvest. The Indian warriors who had proved so important in the battle were also anxious to take their spoils of war and head home. Montcalm was worried about the forces that he would find at Fort Edward, which could be more easily supported from Albany and Massachusetts than was possible at Fort William Henry. Not wanting to give up all that he had earned, he decided that Fort William Henry was good enough. With the surrender becoming official on August 10th, Montcalm had just won a major victory over the British. Or, at least, it so appeared. While victory appeared to be in hand, in reality, things proved to be a bit more complicated. You see, just a moment ago, 
I made that comment that the Indians were enthusiastically waiting to collect their spoils of war and return home. It was their culture, and it was something that Montcalm just completely ignored. Montcalm had not even bothered to consult with the Indian war chiefs. It was a blatant act of disrespect that was not missed by the tribes. For many of the tribes fighting with the French, the process of capturing and killing the vanquished enemy was an important part of honoring their dead from the battle. Well, plundering was certainly part of it. Killing their enemy as a method whereby they could avenge their fallen was critical. It was not something that could simply be overlooked. However, as we have discussed before, there is no chance that Montcalm was going to allow such actions to take place. Montcalm was never okay with what had occurred at Oswego the year before. He was reluctant following the Indian actions at Oswego to use them again. However, they had turned out in such overwhelming numbers that he had little choice but to accept their help. Nobody at all questioned the fact that the Indian warriors were very good at what they did. They proved time and time again in this conflict that they were a very capable fighting force, whose style of warfare was both efficient and terrifying to the European regulars and provincial troops alike. For the tribes, what Montcalm had just done was not just deeply disrespectful to them. It was downright unacceptable. In the short term, the consequence of what the tribes viewed to be nothing less than a betrayal by Montcalm was that they took matters into their own hands in what would become known as the Massacre of Fort William Henry. Under the original treaty, the men who were too injured to travel with the British to Fort Edward were to remain back at Fort William Henry where the French would care for them until they could be returned. Many of those men, too sick to fight back, were killed in the attack. As the column of British marched towards Fort Edward, they were ambushed by Indians hiding in the woods. What ensued was absolute chaos. Others, including a group of black provincials fighting for the British, were captured and taken with the Indians. Women and children who were at camp in the fort were taken by the Indians as well. The attack lasted for hours before French regulars could regain control over the situation. When the situation was finally brought back under control, the Indian tribes quickly gathered up whatever they could, both property and prisoners alike, and promptly left. In the end, some 185 people lie dead, with as many as 500 more captured and taken off as prisoners. The attack would bring with it a dramatic effect for both the British and the French. For the British, there was, understandably, outrage over what had taken place. Absolutely nothing in the world was going to convince them that Montcalm was not behind this. The prevailing belief amongst the survivors, and later the British officers, was that this entire thing, the friendly conditions of surrender, the allowing the men to withdraw, all of it, had been a well-calculated plot by Montcalm to deliver a devastating blow against the British. The British would not soon forget the events of Fort William Henry either. Moving forward in the war, any time that the British had an opportunity for victory, they would quickly remember how Montcalm had ordered an ambush after they had surrendered. The British would never again drain the war, offer the French the honors of war upon their surrenders. Terms of those surrenders became increasingly harsh. The ambush would likewise enrage the British colonists, something that would along with other factors that we will discuss next week, helped to fuel the recruitment of colonists to the fight and would help galvanize the war effort. For Montcalm, the ambush had been as devastating to him as it had been to the British. Despite the beliefs of the British, there really is virtually no chance that this would have been coordinated by Montcalm. The French general was horrified by what had happened and deeply felt the blow that came to his honor. Montcalm worked hard to help pay the ransoms on as many of the prisoners as he could in a desperate attempt to prove that he had nothing to do with the events at Fort William Henry. Besides the effect that the massacre had moving forward on the British, it would prove disastrous for the French as well. The Indian alliances that Vaudreuil had worked so hard to cultivate were, in an instant, gone. We talked about the decision of the French not to move on Fort Edward. Losing the Indian scouts because of the massacre absolutely helped inform Montcalm's decision here. 
Fort Montcalm, he would spend a lot of time desperately trying to repair his damaged reputation while pointing the finger at Vaudreuil. Fort William Henry is an interesting point in the French and Indian War. It was yet another loss for the British. The French now, in theory, had control over Lake George, thus protecting that critical waterway up to Lake Champlain and ultimately Fort Carolin. It was by all rights a big victory for Montcalm personally and the French as a whole. However, the reality is much different. The victory at Fort William Henry would cost the French critical Indian alliances. It would transform how the British fought the war. Finally, for the colonists, it was an event that really helped to galvanize a common anger and animosity towards the French. In many ways, it is not completely unlike the Jumonville affair several years before had been for the French. It provided the British colonists with the necessary indignation to help them conduct their war. But wait! You say it sounds like I'm wrapping up the episode, and we haven't even talked about the expedition to Lewisburg. Surely that went a lot better, right? When Loudon set off for Lewisburg, he did so with a couple of pretty serious problems, other than the mounting threat off near Fort William Henry that we spent today's episode talking about. For Loudon, his biggest concern when leaving was the fact that the British Navy was running late. This meant that Loudon and his men were defenseless as they made their way north. Making matters worse, the French had realized that Lewisburg was a target ripe for the picking. Back in episode 3.23, we had talked about why Lewisburg was strategically important. It provided critical access to the St. Lawrence, which in turn would expose both Quebec and Montreal. Loudon did a fantastic job at keeping the specifics of his plan a secret. But the fact that Lewisburg was a target was a surprise to nobody. The French, wanting to protect the Gulf of St. Lawrence, sent an impressive 18 ships of the line to Lewisburg. When the British Navy did arrive under the command of Admiral Francis Holborn, they were facing a force both larger and more powerful than their own. Holborn, having no interest in seeing his fleet blown to bits, informed Loudon that he would not proceed any further. Loudon had no other option but to agree. The mission would fail without naval involvement. That August, he left his army in Halifax to prepare for an offensive mission against Lewisburg the following year, while he made his way back to New York to deal with the fallout from Fort William Henry, and yet another failed campaign for the British in North America. Next time, we are going to pick up with Loudon facing attacks from all sides. 1757 had been yet another disaster for the British in North America, and changes to those leading the war effort back in London was setting up to change the very nature of the war. Until then, I hope you all have an excellent two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we watch the British desperately try to turn the tide of the war. <laughs>